Everybody see my screen? I think. All right, so um, this is kind of a new thing. I haven't actually drawn anything on a blank canvas in front of people live. This usually I would go straight into line work. So I figured let's approach this kind of with my normal process of how I'd start. Um, so usually the first thing I do is I go into pencil tool. My favorite sketching tool is a colored pencil. It's very light. Um, and I can tilt my pen sideways to get a bigger, bigger sort of brush, um, just to like help me map out my ideas. Um, I am currently drawing on a Cintiq Pro 32. Um, thanks to my job, uh, I work as an art director at The Odd Gentleman, and uh, for our work, they gave me one of these to create my art on. So it's been an amazing um, experience so far, being able to play with that. So as you can see on the bottom right, I have the uh, sort of like my, an older drawing of Space Maria. I'm going to be sort of not really using that as references. I've drawn this character a ton, and it's like something that I've made up. But that's more so for what you guys can see of what I'm kind of aiming for in regards to like final execution, though I may add in a bit more. I like adding a lot of Tony layers, so I might actually do a bit more of that than what's shown in the image. So right now I'm just blocking out the main sort of shapes that I want to aim for, um, sort of mapping out where my key pieces will go. Um, trying to stay relatively zoomed out just so that I can get a feel for how everything looks. Occasionally I'll glance at the navigator just so I can kind of see like how it's all meshing together. I like to also draw my center lines just so that I can make sure that things are not looking skewed. Then I like to draw in sort of like the main torso shape so I can kind of get a feel how it's all going to segment together. Reference in where I like to draw the shoulders coming in. Yeah, again, it's all just main block out shapes just to kind of get an idea. Um, keeping the details very vague so that these vague shapes, in my mind, I, I can kind of visualize like how it'll fit in a three-dimensional space. And so keeping the shapes sort of blocked out and vague helps me visualize that when it comes to actually like putting in the detail. Now, since I got this uh, Cintiq, I used to draw on a, an older Cintiq 21 UX from like 10 years ago, and uh, I would draw it with it relatively flat, but because this guy is so big and it's on their Ergo Pro stand, which I highly recommend if you guys can get a handle on it, um, I've been drawing it more like in uh, sort of vertical mode, like if I were painting on a canvas or an easel, um, which was difficult at first doing line work, but I actually got really used to it, and so this is like my preferred way to draw now, which is something that I didn't I would I didn't see myself doing like ten or fifteen years ago. Back then, it would have been drawing like heads down on a table, um, with my nose like almost touching the paper. I remember like growing up, my dad would give me a lot of grief when he'd see me drawing at the dinner table, and like my nose was just right up there. He said, "You're gonna go blind. You're gonna have to wear glasses." And so now I'm sitting up all proper and stuff. I'm sure you'll be super proud. All right, let's get in some of this hair here. All right, so face details. I like to start with the brow line and then the overall eye shape. And kind of make sure my spacing is good. I also like to draw in a vague shape of how the nose will be. Um, gives me an idea of how it will fit in the space. So 
Okay, so now I can see that things are a bit skewed, so this is where I go in. I have my high key set to Q for my, uh, what's it called, lasso tool. So this way I can go and adjust proportions to make sure that things are placed in the right area. I used to be against this back when I started doing digital art um, coming from drawing on paper because you can't do this on paper. And so I would just erase and redraw, but it got really frustrating trying to learn new techniques um, because I wasn't doing these micro adjustments to, to sort of understand it better. So this is something that I highly recommend for those that are trying to find like their style or learn how to get proportions and things correct on a certain art style. Just shift it around and see like, I mean, the, the trick is like you want to unlock it in your mind that this is how this is supposed to look and this is in the right direction. And so it sometimes takes more effort to erase and redraw and draw it incorrectly and do it over and over again. And you're just trying to figure out where the nose is supposed to be. So instead of having to redraw the nose a billion times, just draw it once and move it around. And this is also just the rough stage too, so no harm, no foul. I've sometimes run into problems before where I would actually like my rough sketch a lot more than my final, um, just because there's so much character in like the really, really early roughs. And so it's <laughs> sometimes it's a mixed bag and it's like, man, I like my sketch better. Alright, another thing I like to do is flip. Uh, adjust. So, because of this colored pencil tool, you'll notice that I'm also drawing on pure black. But because I'm sketching so lightly, it comes off um, light gray. Uh, so that being said, if I needed to actually like lock in a detail that I don't want to, I want to make sure that I get this right spot. Like I can press down harder so that I don't lose that line when I'm going over with the uh, the cleanup. This is feeling pretty good. Probably shrink this down a little bit. The top of the ear should be should not be above the eye. Um, of course, that depends on the kind of style that you're aiming to do. Um, and generally, the draw line kind of meets the bottom of the ear as well. But I'm also not like. I'm an anatomy expert, but this is kind of taking what works and bringing it here. Oh, and if you guys have dogs and, and kids, I have two dogs and three kids. So, um, of course, everyone's working from home nowadays. Uh, so my apologies if there's any sort of background noise. and bring my pencil tool back up. Um, another shortcut I really like is using the uh, resizing um, your tool with the brackets. So it's been really easy to like, okay, I'm gonna get in vague shapes here in the outline and then I can bring it in shorter and then draw in the smaller, finer details. Um, yeah, hairline's feeling pretty good. Let's see, things Fluff in some of these a bit more. Cool. A little adjustment here. Now, in case a lot of you guys didn't know, uh, one of my biggest sort of retro anime inspirations is uh, Kenichi Sonoda of um, Gunsmith Cat's fame and Bubblegum Crisis. Um, I've always been infatuated with his style and felt that um, I just like the way he drew eyes and hair and sort of like how he shapes his character's faces. And it's um, been one of my biggest influences as far as like this art goes. Like there's 
at first it was Ranma, but then over the years of drawing anime characters with like really big eyes, like Rumiko Takahashi style, it wasn't the style that really fit naturally for me. And so I always felt that my style was a mix of sort of the big eyed approach, but it was always more subdued. Um, sort of like it has like a foot in realism, I guess. So I, I think that's reflected a bit in the art that I draw. So I'm going to readjust this guy as well. Get that bit mess out there. Same with this one. Now when I'm doing a warping here, I hold the control key so it lets you do like a free warp as opposed to like an even transform. Um, it's a good way to just kind of line up details and shapes. Alright. Um, let's draw more of the muscular detail. So you can see I'm just pressing a little bit harder and it's giving me more of that, that sort of separation that I'm wanting so that when I go into cleanup I don't get confused with my details. I still feels a little off, so I may adjust this bit here. I remember started doing this back in junior high. I think one of the the animes that got me really into it was uh, watching the the animated series of Ranma. I think I was in sixth grade. Um, it's crazy to think now because I don't think I would even show like my son when he gets into sixth grade ramen because I feel like it's a uh, it's something that's it's just lost to an era um but that's that's one of the styles that sort of got me into drawing it and so since then I've been trying to perfect sort of the facial proportions and how in placements of how to capture that that look um which has been a challenge over the years um but once I mastered it, or I felt like I, I mastered it enough, it was very difficult to shift into different art styles, like doing Western-style comic books or uh, sort of like a softer Disney approach because the proportions were different than what I would what I taught myself. Um, but it's it's been it's been fun like learning those different styles and trying to capture that into different pieces of work that I do. And so a lot of the work I do, like for the odd gentleman, is not anime. It's a lot of different styles. It's kind of its own style. Um, so it's it's kind of a cool hybrid to just sort of mix in different breaths of work that that are a part of you, but it still feels like your own. It feels unique. Okay, I think I'm ready to start the lines. Let's see how we are on time. Cool. All right, so let's talk about layers. So this is my rough layer here, obviously. Um, I go straight into inks afterwards. I lower the opacity of my rough layer. Now for my inking process, I actually got gifted a cool brush that uh, my friend Michael Doig um, created. It's actually a, a painting brush. He called it the perfect oil paint. Um, the reason I like it is that it has a soft toothiness, like a pencil. Um, he uses this for painting his backgrounds. He's a, an illustrator. And so it has like this sort of painty toothiness that like you press down harder, it'll get darker. Uh, so yeah, I can do it real light here. And he called it the perfect oil paint because it doesn't really bleed. And so like if you wanted to put in a shade or something somewhere, um, it doesn't blend with the colors that are underneath it, but you can sort of control and sample. So here I'm doing a quick sampling with like holding alt and just kind of sampling in the different gradients of this. So, so yeah, I like using this for um, inking lately. 
I used to use a, um, a pen tool that I put together. Uh, I called it, let's see, G Pen Clean Dead. <laughs> so the reason being is that I have the stabilization set up to 53. The brush size of it, um, it's usually like around six or seven, depending on how big the file is. But the reason I like this line is it's practically a dead line. Let's take a look at its uh, settings. So as you can see here, the minimum value is 75% of the full size. This is the pressure curve, like 0% and then 100%. But there's like a slight stagger in there. It just kind of makes it a little interesting. And the reason I, I like this one is that if I'm drawing a, a line that I feel needs a lot of attention, like usually long straight curves, like if I need to, I can, I can sketch lightly. So this is me barely pressing on the page. It comes out the same size. I'm like, oh wait, this is a hard line. I need to draw it harder so that I don't mess up my, my line. I can press down harder and it still comes out the same size. And then the other cool thing about this tool is the, uh, if I draw fast, it it kind of straightens out, and so it lets me sort of do some cool, interesting shapes. I, I've actually been approaching round shapes uh, more polygonal, and I say that like for if I had a circle, let's do let's do a quick rough out of a circle. So there's my circle. I don't. I'm not like that guy that can draw that perfect circle in one go. Um, so if I were to do this, instead of doing like, I got to make this a perfect smooth circle, like to me, it, it works. Oh, that's not too bad. <laughs> um, I actually like approaching it, um, a bit, like if it were make it made out of straight shapes, like if it more rigid. Um, and to me that feels a bit more interesting because it, from a distance, it looks round, but when you get up close, it you can see the ridges. I just think it's a little bit has a little bit more character, and that's just kind of the style that I've been doing. It also could be like a shortcoming of myself, but you know what? I, I still like it. So for today, we're not going to use the deadline. I'm actually going to use the other one, the perfect oil paint. Let's bring this back down. This one's not a good size. Small. Let's go to six. All right. This one has hardly any stabilization on it. I think this one is set at 15, so it's pretty standard just to get rid of any possible jitters. Um, I like it because it still feels like you're sketching. So you can make lines that are not fully committal, but you're still committing. I, I guess this approach is more like you're crafting your line. Um, so a lot of the sketches that I've been putting online recently have been with this approach where I would, I could pay more attention to sort of line, line thickness and shape, um, and give it a little bit of character, darken up some spots where light may be occluded, gives a little bit more depth in the space. But yeah, this one just lets me do like more sketchy line work. I think this also works really well for this sort of cell quality, um, just because it's uh, has more grit. All right. The only challenge with working with this is that you can't rely too much on your autofill, um, which you'll see that technique come in later. Um, that's been a huge time save when it comes to um, doing this style of work because it's instead of having to like hand paint in um, your toning, you can just autofill. All right, so for the eyes, I like to map out the opening before I start drawing the eyelid shape. Just to make sure that I kind of get them in the right spot and in the right size where parts of the eyelid sort of meet like evenly across. Okay. Anime eyelashes. 
probably some of the hardest things to draw. So it's very specific and stylized. Alright, so here's the crease on the eyelid that goes on top. This is also like my one of my favorite parts of this process is not doing the fill and just kind of seeing where everything falls. Uh, I like seeing the outline of the uh, In, the, in anime style too, you also notice a lot of similar, I guess, sort of drawing tropes and like what parts of the face you draw. I mean, that can go for any sort of art style, but that's also something to keep in mind um, when jumping around with different art styles is like what, what details are usually drawn um, when characters are created, when they draw faces. Like, um, and I mentioned Kenichi Sonoda earlier. Um, if you are looking into getting into retro anime art or any kind of art style that is outside of your wheelhouse and just trying to find your, your sort of unique voice in it, it's definitely a good idea to sort of reference those you deem are the masters. Um, and then from there you develop, you know, into your own sort of take um, and style. I mean, right now I, I consider it sort of like honing your, your voice. Um, and sharpening your skills so that when you do need to draw in, in different styles, um, it's your hand is trained to, to sort of recreate what you're wanting to do. It's like cat breaking. All right, so let's draw some hair. This is where I kind of start doing that sort of polygon approach where like my curves aren't all the time like perfectly curved. Um, Call it the sideburn, but it's not really a sideburn, it's just the hair that covers your ear in the front. There's like different segments. There's the face, then there's like the bangs that go here, and then there's the quote unquote sideburns, and then there's like the head shape part of the rest of the hair, and then it's you know frills out to the rest, so it's like the back. But then there's also like an anime, like the the sort of larger flyaways that don't really have a home. You have to kind of just kind of figure it out, um, which is a challenge when you're trying to recreate something in 3D because it, everything kind of needs a, a point of origin um, where in sort of retro anime styles, especially, you can get away with not drawing in that detail and it still works. All right. Another thing too is that the hair usually covers eye uh, I try not to as much as possible, but it, it doesn't look like it's too bothersome now, but once you get to color, um, you'll notice that it kind of makes the face uneven if you cover your character's face with like a chunk of hair. Even if you draw in the line details and stuff, it's I usually always have the hair, even if the hair was longer, I would color the eye first, um, and the hair would be like magically behind her eye. It doesn't make sense in any other application, but it does here. Alright, so let's see. Well, I always like to map out the other ear, even if it's going to be occluded, just so that it gives me an idea of the balance, the face balance. Um, Cool. 
I also tend to find myself second guessing the uh, the rough sketch underneath, and so that's why I spent more time on the rough, just so that I feel like I've mapped out the details the way that I can confidently trust them. Um, I used to keep my roughs very loose and just like figure it out in ink, and I end up just wasting time, or I get to a part that uh, I can't commit to and draw a good line because I'm mentally unsure if that line's supposed to be there or not. And so I like to spend a bit more time now mapping out my path um, before I draw in all the details so that I'm not like surprising myself with a detail that I don't know what to do with when it comes time to execute good line work. So like here I'm still following the path. I may have deviated a bit, so I'm gonna draw it out and see how it works. And again, a lot of the details here on the inside of the hair are actually going to come in the toning process. Uh, so that will come later. It'll be sort of leaving it to the shading to bring out those details instead of drawing them in. Okay. Now I am going to use the deadline tool when I start going and doing the toning because it, it'll be uh, cleaner lines. For this part, I'm actually going to keep this line work because it's more so just the key lines. Um, I've been going back and forth between erasing my my toning lines um, and keeping them in because sometimes keeping them in gives it a lot of neat character. Um, that's that's really fun. Um, but it depends on like what final product is going to look like. Cool. All right, so we got that chunk. I think I trust the rest of my other hair, but I'll come back to that in a few. So we're drawing the body, it's also kind of picking out the lines that you want um, to draw. It's interesting because the, the shape of how you draw it really dictates the actual final form. Oh, I forgot to draw her bandana. Is that the... On the fly. Okay. Sure. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> no, let's go through as many as we need to get there, for sure. Um, I've been drawing it since I was probably, let's see, how old are you in sixth grade? 13, maybe? 13, 12? Um, yeah, for, for me, I went through like a weird phase. Like when I was exposed to anime, I was like comparing it to, you know, you're comparing it to like 90s Disney where everything's very flat in colors. And to me, it didn't appeal. And then you watch some anime that's like realistic and they got like, they're animating these ridiculous scenes on ones and there's like three or four layers of toning on it, like shading, shading, highlight, and it's all moving. Or they're like robot parts, and I'm like, how, how are they doing this? And, and so I was infatuated with it because of how much detail they brought. Um, and so to me, the, the sort of dark period back then was like, if it's not anime, it's wrong. Um, and so, you know, and nowadays it's, you know, I, my eyes have opened to many different styles that I'm like infatuated with. Like I love Western style animation 
that's sort of like Disney, like all the cartoons that we see out of Western animation now, I'm totally in love with. Um, and uh, like, and they have really good animation sensibilities. And so it's, it's kind of done a flip flop. Um, in my opinion, yeah, like, uh, I'm, I'm more infatuated with Western animation now than I was back then. And back then I was more interested in Japanese animation, um, compared to now. Uh, <laughs> you mean art style tropes or like just tropes? Uh, yes, I... Oh, for sure. Yeah, you need like the big sideburns, the big fluffy hair. Like most people would draw um, other artists, they would like start mapping out their head and then they got their eyes and stuff. But like the head shape is actually including the hair. And I'm like, that's not enough hair. It needs to be like this big. And so I, I, I miss that trope a lot. I think a lot, also back then, um, I think they pushed the... Uh, they were able to push more um, interesting silhouettes with big hair. And so, I mean, to me nowadays, a lot of anime hair feels very similar. I think that's why a lot of people resonated with My Hero Academia because of how ridiculous their designs were. Um, and so like you can distinctly see which character is which just, you know, by their silhouette. And uh, so yeah, um, I think that's a trope that needs to come back, the big hair. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it's missing the retro style. Maybe that's why. <laughs> that that's my that's my humble opinion. Um, I think it's interesting. So I mentioned Kenichi Sonoda as a reference, right? The uh, I only have his art books from the early '90s. He started moving on to different. His style evolved as with every artist, and. Um, I'm not a fan of his of his newer work. Like he lost a lot, in my opinion, he lost a lot of his uh, the that sort of aesthetic that that inspired me, um, which is weird because like his his art is still you know kind of the same. It's just a little different. And so I don't know if it's like it's cleaner or or what, but yeah, um, definitely. I just love the the retro anime aesthetic. You know, there's a few artists here in webinar that do different styles from that era that are amazing. Um, which to outsiders, they like all look the same. Like, oh, it's just retro anime from like somebody, th somebody threw it out. Like, like, oh, it's from the seventies. I'm like, mm, but I didn't really feel like I needed to correct them because it's, you know, they recognized it as something that looked familiar. <laughs> yeah yes that actually was <laughs> that's funny you bring it it was that was a hundred percent a goal of mine when so um a few years back i was drawing for for work we you know i don't draw any anime for work and so like i i just wanted to get back into it because it was something to like unwind with and so i started drawing this character that was very reminiscent of like eiko from project eiko and Ranma, and a ponytail, and it was like a strong female character. Um, and so she didn't have a name for many years. I think we just referred to her as like the fluffy hair girl. And because um, I would just draw her hair bigger and bigger and bigger. And so um, I did that and then it, it just took off. Um, which, which it, it comes back to another question I think you had asked me earlier. And um, from stemming from that, I got into doing some work for the Game Grumps, and that stemmed 100% from the Space Maria stuff. It was because I was drawing in that style that I was passionate about, um, which is a testament in itself, um, especially for you artists out there that, that are trying to find your voice online and figuring out like what your your art is going to be, is just draw like... Draw what you're passionate about. Draw what you love, because it. I think people can feel that when when they see your artwork online, they can tell when you're 
not fully into something or you're just doing it for a check or uh, cloud or whatever, but like if you're drawing something that that you legit love, like it shows in your artwork. Um, and so, you know, because of that, because I kept drawing the same character and she was my muse for a long time, like it, it sort of became something bigger than I would have ever imagined. I mean, she's on the cover of like <laughs> of y'all's flyers for Clip Studio and Wacom and these are, you know, I don't have a lot of companies and businesses that I like really fanboy about, but it's like you guys have been a part of like my professional career for so many years and it's it's an amazing it's an amazing thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, technical for my program layout or, uh, okay. So I'm left-handed. So I, I like the fact that I can move on my windows to the left side. So everything's kind of here. Um, I usually work on a 4k setup, but it's really difficult to see on a stream because the details get really small. I mean, I want you guys to be able to sort of see the sort of behind the scenes of like, this is how David does his layers. Um, usually the way I would set it up is I would have, as you see this window here, if I were, if I were working on the same picture, I would go to window, new window of the same drawing. And I would, instead of having the navigator window there, I could go and zoom in on this one. I'm like, okay, I'm going to really shade in the eyes here. And then on this, I can, I can kind of see how it's coming together without having to zoom out. Oops, too far. There. So like if I were to go and shade in her eyes. And then I can I can look at my little thumbnail. So Clip Studio. That that's how I usually like how to work in Clip Studio. Um a lot of the artwork I'm doing for work is involving uh, orthographs or orthographical views for 3D artists. And so having the grid readily available and also doing the window has been really helpful with that. So if I were doing something similar here, I have a shortcut key set up to, I think, control and apostrophe, and it gets me the grid. And so like I can go in and do an orthographical, like these eyes need to match up, you know, from a three quarter view to a profile view. And then instead of having to zoom all the way out to make sure it's lined up, you know, I can, I can work on my details here and then have my reference in the second window, you know, comparing like two different images. Um, so that's been like my more professional workflow in that regard. Um, and as far as my setup, this is a Cintiq Pro 32. Um, it's ginormous. If it's been amazing to work on, but if you don't have the space, it's, it's unwieldy. Um, I had to make a big desk to use this one. So that's been, uh, helpful. Um, as far as like drawing experiences go, drawing on, on Wacom has been, for me, it's been the best. Um, I think I covered an off-brand tablet last year and that one, it was great for the price, but it just was missing the finesse that you find in Wacom products. Um, and so I, I came from a 10 year old Cintiq 21 UX and I used that for about 10 years. I think it came out like 2010 or 2009 or something. Um, the feel is the same. Like it's, they like they've mastered it, and so it's it's even better now. Uh, and that I think is something that other other companies are struggling to try and sort of hone in on. Like how do how do we get that Wacom feel? So yeah, that's my setup. Um, I'm on. I'm working on PC, obviously. I don't know if that's obvious. I think it is. So, yeah. Yes. Yes, just for you guys. <laughs> uh, no, because I'm the only one touching the file. Um, I know, I know what they're going to do, so I, I, I usually don't. Um, 
So you can see here I have rough. So matte is the next thing that I go with. I bring up a pen tool that I use. Uh, I call it my G Pen Color, and it's a no stabilized pen that has like a really wide pressure. Um, I think yeah, zero to a hundred. Um, and so I go here and use this to sort of fill in. Um, you're like, but David, you're drawing black. It's like, oh, it'll come around. Wait, the magic. Um, just come up there, there, and it's here. Okay. So I'm going to try and fill in as many gaps as I can, because this is going to be sort of my mat for the coloring process. Um, and the toning process, it saves a lot of time. So this is me not trusting my line work because it's so thin. All right. Cool. So the next tool that I bring up is the magic wand. Um, I have it set up to refer to all layers. Currently I'm on this matte layer. Um, when you refer to all layers, it will reference every layer that's visible on your canvas. And so I'm going to select everything outside and hopefully it gets everything on the outside. Perfect. So I invert it with Control shift i and now I'm highlighting the interior. Um, I have a shortcut set to... <laughs> I always get nervous pressing this. It's Alt-Delete. And <laughs> it fills it in. <laughs> and so with that, I have my mat. Um, the reason why I keep it 100% is because sometimes if the opacity was lowered, it'll accidentally still, it won't pick up the lines that I drew in for the mat. Um, but that also lets me see the overall silhouette. So yeah, we got the mat in there. Um, I go in with the pen tool again and touch up anything that I feel maybe off. I'll probably just fill this in just to bring the hair all the way around. Uh, this needs to be filled in there. There's two purposes for this too. Um, in the coloring process, I'm going to be coloring on top of this. But whenever I finish it, you'll sometimes find gaps in your in your fill that um, will expose the canvas or the white space behind your drawing. And so whenever I'm done with the artwork, I bring this all the way up to 100% and it'll fill in those with black. So now that we got the mat, um, oh, it's a good thing I have colors there too. Okay. So I do my base colors next. I use, oh, I have a default setting. I set it up to 3000 by 4000 at 72 DPI. Um, I usually go larger. This is pretty large for just a character portrait. I think 100% scale. Let's do that real quick. Reset, 100%. Yeah, it's like this. It's hard for me to see. Yeah. I try not to. Yeah. If I if yeah, if there's like a detail that I need to get right, like usually the eyes I would have to zoom in on. Um, but that's why I like to have the navigator open or a separate window so that I can kind of view like what my workflow is. From here I like to actually start doing the toning. So these two that are labeled toning, um I set them to multiply. So highlight both. Set it to a multiply, which darkens. I oh, should set these to multiply as well. And what I do here is I set them, I usually end up at like between 30 and 40% opacity. Um, but for when I'm working, um, because of the bucket tool and fill tool, I set it up a bit higher so that the bucket tool has a better reference point. So on this top one, I'm actually going to use it for my line work, um, which I'll be setting up with my deadline. All right, so let's set up some shape. So this is what you'll see like on a pencil Genga, um, which is like the sort of reference sheet for um, animation. This is where they kind of have everything all separated. Um, for the cell artists, this is where I draw in the shading. Um, 
I'd like to say there's a technique here, but a lot of the time I usually follow my gut. Oh, uh, to digress real quick. What I like to do is hold control and click. If you click your picture, I'm referencing my mat now. So now I can't draw outside of my mat. So I can actually over shoot my lines and not have to worry about having to erase anything later on. Okay. So here you can see that I'm starting to bring in more of the three-dimensional shape to the hair that I didn't draw in. Let's go. Um, Clip Studio actually helped me push that along relatively quick. Before, I would actually go in with uh, just a big bulk tool um, to like draw in the shading lines, but there would be a lot of cleanup involved that was time consuming. Um, like, not gonna lie, Clip Studio and their bucket fill tool with multi layer referencing like changed my life. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's something that I think. Photoshop followed suit many years later, and I was like, finally, but, you know, at that point, it's like I've already moved on. Alright, I think before that, I was using Psy, which feels very similar um, to Clip Studio, but it, it's missing a lot of, sort of, uh, I guess, I mean, modern features that um, make the process a lot faster. And so like for me, this is this is all digital art. This is something that you're you're doing. I wouldn't say to like save time, but there's there's no reason for you to not approach some of these shortcuts and things um, because they're there for a reason. All right, so I'm gonna put a loop here. Yes, yeah. Now there's some things that you can't cheat like. Painting, um, painting. I think you just have to, you have to put down all those brush strokes. Like there's, <laughs> there's not really any, a way around around that. Um. So I got started back. Let's see, geez, I was like twenty three. Yeah. Uh, man, I just aged myself. All right, that was like thirteen or fourteen years ago. Um. I met an art mentor of mine, his name's Evan Cagle, who's an amazing artist. Um, he's still my, my sort of, he's still masterclass to me um, and a huge inspiration. And so he was working on an animation back in the day that required um, digital art. And so I think the first thing I started drawing on was a, uh, it was like a four by five or four by three Wacom like Intuos type of interface and I remember it being the most challenging thing drawing diagonal lines because um, the screen was so small and so that's how I learned how to do digital art. It was not graceful, it was really messy and terrible at times but it, it got a lot better over the years. So that's how I got introduced to the medium. Um, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I didn't have, I didn't have the marker set up because I didn't have the money for it. Um, so back in the day, I used to work in a restaurant full time. Um, that was my sort of bread and butter and art was kind of what I did around it. Um, this is before the internet, like really fully took off, like before DeviantArt and everything. Um, and so 
I did a lot of my drawings like in notebooks or sketchbooks or on blank pieces of typing paper with ballpoint pens. And that's actually sort of how um, my friend Evan found me. I was drawing at a coffee shop, I think, one day after work. And uh, just like I remember telling my, my girlfriend, now wife at the time, like, I just need to draw. I need to get some ideas out or something. And so she's like, all right. And so I went out there by myself and he kept walking by and like saw what I was working on. And so he's like, can I look at your drawings? I was like, sure. And he's like, he saw potential um, in us working together and, and I guess my skill set. And so that sort of serendipitous moment was definitely something that kickstarted uh, my career and my path towards, you know, pursuing art as a career. It is kind of like a movie. <laughs> yeah, he's actually he's actually the one that got me the job. He got my he got my foot in the door to get the job that I'm at now. Because um, before then, I was back at the restaurant again. Um, it's crazy. <laughs> I I mean I, I at least like moved up. I think I was like managing um, at the time, so that was a challenge too, balancing the both. Oh, okay. Sure, sure. Okay. Let's let's throw some color on here. And then oh, a little buttery. Hold on a sec. I thought I was going fast. Alright, so let's go into the coloring process real quick for the hair. So now that we have this multiply set up, um I get rid of that. Go back into my first base color, highlight this. Um, so now that we have her, let me start with her skin first. I'm gonna have a shortcut for G for my bucket tool. I have it referencing, da, 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 reference other layers. All right, see how that feels, two layers. It's a little better, saturated. All right, so now it's referencing all the line work that I've done, um, but you can see that there's cracks and things that I'll have to go back in and fill, which, let's really paint this. Oh. Okay. For the eyes, it's the same story. Eyes and face. So I go in, fill in all these cracks. A little bit there. Okay, cool. All right, let's draw on the eyes. I like to keep the eyes not quite white, so it's always a little bit under. I actually should bring this up for reference. Look at this guy. Okay. Hair color. I like to keep this separate actually, so let me do this first. So this Thank you. Yeah. No, it's not really part of the style. Um, I think I covered a little bit on that a bit earlier, um, referencing more so that when I do my rough sketch, I keep my shapes vague, so only draw the lines that I need, um, so that when it comes to adding in, like something like this, even if I fill it with flat color, it will still feel um sort of alive because your eye will kind of fill in the form and so it's it's really sort of nailing down the uh, the approach you make when it comes to drawing your overall shapes um that makes it feel three-dimensional all right let's feel cool again cool it's all coming together 
Okay, I want to at least get to that toning part so you guys can see that. Okay. Nice. I like it when it feels, fills, feels, fills nice. Um, my favorite part is getting the good sketch done. I think that's the hardest hurdle. Um, the bl starting with the blank canvas and going from that to an idea uh, is the hardest part for me, um, just because it's very easy to sort of second guess. And it's, it's not incredibly gratifying because it's just a rough sketch, right? And then once you get over that hurdle, then the rest of it is just bringing that original sketch to life. And it becomes satisfying seeing all, all the colors and everything sort of come together um, and it starts to feel real. So I, I do enjoy the line work process a lot lately though. It depends on what it is. Yeah, sometimes um, there, there's a crippling thing when it comes to like doing concept art where it's very, you know, you, you'll immediately come with an idea and a prompt. You're like, oh, I know exactly what I'm going to draw. And uh, sometimes it's not correct. And so you get redirected and you're like, oh, okay, I got to try and calibrate. And the person that you're, you know, hopefully the person you're working with realizes that so that they, they try to give you references and things to help you recalibrate into the vision that they 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 tasked you with. Um, all right, so from here, I have my multiply layer set up for the line work. Um, what I also like to do is set another layer, which I usually do for color two. And instead of just doing a bulk multiply, I hand pick the color that I'm gonna paint into it. So for the eye, I like to go a little cooler, saturate a little darker. Fill that in. And now it's referencing the black line that I drew. Um, that's why it's still darker. So I feel pretty good about that. Same thing with the hair. The way I set this up is so that um, I can just work on its own. I can separate the hair and the body as needed because the hair is usually more messy to clean up. I let's go for a little bit here, here, not too far. This one. Yeah. And it's all filling nicely, like a day. Nice. So this one's obviously going to be hand filling that one. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like paint by numbers. Okay, and then get the hair toned in. So let's. So now that I have it separated, I don't have to worry about going into the skin. Um, it's all been separated out. Okay, and so for the skin layer, that one is. Let's see. I always like to go a little bit redder. So we only did her face right now. So let's a bit redder, a little more saturated and darker. A little more. Okay, that's good. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I can talk to to my friend to see if he's fine with sharing it. I don't see why not though. Um, but yeah, I can I can get that available. 
or I'll find out if I can make it available. I love it. It's my favorite line tool. It's a little unwieldy, um, but once you get down to figuring out like how it actually works. Um, all right, so one more thing here, and then I'll cut it off at toning. I'm oh, sorry, um, highlights, because highlights are easy. So I'm just going to put a little white in the eye. Cool. Oh, I forgot to fill in black here. Boop. All right, so this is where I come in with the matte. Now when it, you can see all these gaps here from the line work and the color. It's cool though because this has like a little bit of integrity like if it were an actual cell. Um, I can wrap this up and it'll fill in everything else. So all the gaps that were there are no longer there. Um, it just makes it feel a little bit cleaner. Uh, but all right, so for the highlights, um, this is really easy too. So you set this to screen um, at 100% and you just sample the color. So I'm going to be using the hair color here to sample that red. And when I start painting it on, that's my highlights. For the skin, it's a little bit different. Oh, so I fill these in. Boom, boom. Clean it up a little bit if you like. Get some subtractive editing. Give it some sharp edges. Oh, that looks messed up. Fix that. Cool. So that's yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, and then for the skin, it's a little different. I actually like to sample the shading. Because if I sample at 100% her skin, it comes out um, really bright. And so I usually end up sampling this, and that gives me sort of a little extra. So this gives it that three-dimensional feel. Um, yeah, just to sort of give a bit more depth to it. Um, another trick, too, since I have this color, too, set up, what I like to do is highlight that and fill that in my multiply layer or a different multiply layer um, to give it a hue. So now it's darker, um, but I can adjust, oops, doesn't work. Um, I can adjust the, uh, the sort of visibility of it. And then by that same accord, another trick, um, let's add a new layer, let's set this to overlay. If I highlight the same thing, I can control my overlay. The way overlay works is that when at 50% um, in the black and white spectrum, um, nothing will change. When you go here, it'll darken it. When you go up, it'll lighten it. Um, so I usually start off a little bit dark. I get my gradient tool set to an oval, going from color to disappear, um, uh, foreground to transparent. So I set it down to, like, say, a dark blue. I can give it a little bit of life and color variance. Um, and then I can do it all in the same layer. Let's bring in some of the highs. This works out really well on faces and stuff too. Yeah, it's just very subtle. Sort of like a like an ambient bounce light kind of thing. Yeah, and then at the end of the day, you can decide if you want to keep your panel lines or not. Actually, I like setting this to, after I'm done with all the fill, I like to set it to overlay um, because then it'll just sort of darken in a similar color. Um, gives it a little bit of visual movement. Yeah. Almost made it. <laughs> so I have this on, on I'm, I have it recorded, so... Um, I'll finish this up and then I'll post the finished version of that um, online and I'll be sure to tag you guys in. Cool.
<laughs> awesome. Awesome. Thanks for everyone that showed up. Some gobsmacked. Hey guys, I just realized that I recorded the entire thing earlier without my desktop audio, so um, in this VOD, you'll definitely hear me talking to myself. Um, so for references to questions, um, I mean, for the most part, I was talking by myself anyway, um, but without context to questions, it may get a little confusing. So I'm going to cut audio for the rest of the VOD and um, just finish up the rest of the drawing so you guys can see the process. Um, I also upped my resolution back to 4K, so um, if you can't really read the the text on screen, uh, just feel free to rewind back and see like what layering um, naming conventions I was using, and then um, yeah, so catch y'all on the flip.
All right, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to add another layer of toning, which is a multiply layer. I'm actually going to keep this black at 40%. I'm going to put it right here. And this will give um, everything a bit more depth. That arrow 40. Okay.
All right, cool. Uh, yeah, I'll call this done for now. Um, I'm glad to be able to finish this. Hopefully this is helpful. Um, you guys enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.